Well, good evening, everybody. How's it going? It's about 5.48 p.m. here on the west coast of North America. 5.48, we will begin our program on Palouse Hills, the Palouse Luss, at the top of the hour at six o'clock local time. So if you're watching this in replay, go ahead and skip ahead 12 minutes. Otherwise, looks like we have some folks with us. How's it going tonight? Hello, Karen, Kelly, Larry from New York City. So we take this time uh, for a few minutes here and uh, I can kind of see where you're watching from and we can also make sure that we're doing okay with our technology issues. There's no wind tonight at all. It's perfectly calm. Kind of a overcast sky has been most of the afternoon. Everybody's out walking around, driving around. Menlo, Washington, South Bend, Indiana, Caldwell, Idaho. Hometown of John Blakely. Yeah, we doing okay? Hello, Mother. Lockwood, New York. A town in Maine I cannot pronounce. Hello, Evelyn. We have our first thing that fell over here. I guess there's just a wisp, just a wisp of a stir. I've even got the chimes up because it's so calm. So if you start hearing clanging with the chimes, <laughs> I had to pause. I saw John Stockton, but it was you, Dale. Uh, it was you, Dale. Let's take a peek at the schedule. Hope you had a nice Monday. I didn't see you yesterday. Didn't see you most of Sunday, except for our live stream on Sunday morning. So it feels like we haven't done this for a while. Hello, good evening, UK. Or, uh, yeah, evening, I guess. Morning? I guess morning? Middle of the night? Yeah. So up here is uh, Palouse Hills. We're about to do that, and tomorrow night, and... Thursday night are actually related. So this is kind of boom. So I'll explain this when we begin for real, but there's, I'm kind of pleased with, as I started to think seriously about these three shows, I, I think we'll be able to make some nice connections that I haven't been able to make before. So I'm kind of as pumped up about doing this and then this and then this and there'll be a kind of a narrative between those three shows 6 p.m pacific time tonight tomorrow and thursday night and then the guys are going to come and pressure wash the outside of the house on friday we're having our house painted same color but uh so i probably will be indoors even if the weather's nice on saturday and sunday morning at 9 a.m but i'm not totally sure what their schedule is. But Ice Age Floods Week for the most part, and uh, I'm excited to do this with you. I'm gonna ask one more time. We've got over 300 folks already. Um, I feel like uh, the conditions are perfect for this, but you're doing okay with audio and visuals, what you're telling me. Liz is upstairs doing some sort of Pilates with uh, the internet up there. So I wanna make sure that we're doing okay here. Great, sounds good. Five by five. Terrific. Uh, time for a couple thank yous, I guess. Tonight's episode actually is uh, connected to the wine industry here in Washington, the wine industry here in Washington. I don't know anything about growing grapes. 
but uh, I'm down to the last sliver of my last bottle from uh, the fine folks, Linda and Earl, down in Livermore, California, who have been sending this wonderful wine up. So thanks again, Linda and Earl from Cedar Mountain Winery in Pleasanton, California, the Bay Area, essentially, East Bay. So thanks very much. And there's something else I need to uh, send out a thank you for. So the mailman came Saturday, I guess. And uh, this arrived and I left it on the kitchen counter all day because I thought it was Liz ordering something. Looked like, like a running shorts or something, I don't know. From, uh, from Zazzle. So then Liz got home late in the day and said, uh, aren't you gonna open your package? I'm like, oh, that's mine? Professor Nick Zentner. So thank you, Rini and Tim from Moscow, Idaho, up in the panhandle of Idaho, just across the state line from Pullman, Washington. Rini and Tim, I appreciate your generosity and thank you for the surprise. And you're like, what is it? You'll have to wait around until the Q&A for the reveal. You see how clever I'm getting now? No, it, it makes more sense to show you when we do a Q&A as opposed to right now. So thank you, Rini and Tim. We got five minutes. Let me take a look at a few more of these. Oroville, way up there in the Okanagan. Susan, hello, Trinidad, Colorado. Well, we've got guesses what the package is. I don't even know what Zazzo is. That's how out of it I was opening it. It's like, what is this? Another bottle opener? Renton, hello. Mount Vernon, Patrick. Hey, Patrick, I didn't know you lived in Mount Vernon. I knew you were over there. I didn't know it was Mount Vernon. Interesting. I'll put, I'll file that away. Newport, Oregon. Newcastle, Australia. Daryl, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Lebanon, Oregon. I like your area, David. Naples, Florida. Calgary. This is always so fun. Eugene, say hi to my kid. Well, let's see. Laptop is functional. Uh, you can see most of the board. There's not a glare. The lighting's perfect. All right, should we have a stare off? Should we have a blinking contest? You win. I was never very good at that. I got dry eyes. Oh, I got I got all sorts of stuff for you guys tonight. I got carried away. I got stuff from the kitchen. I got a sample that I put in a jar from on top of the hill. bunch of papers and things laying out in the grass and I always forget about half of them until we're done. I'm like, ah, but that's the beauty of this. Just kind of roll with things and if it occurs to you, it occurs to you. <laughs> right between the eyes. Okay. Yeah, two and a half minutes according to my watch. So would you mind? I'm going to go wander and uh, think about what the plan is here. 
And I'll be back in a couple of minutes to start our program. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to my home. My name is Nick Zentner. You're watching this live from my backyard. I teach geology at the college here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. And our topic tonight is a bunch of soil. Soil that's in eastern Washington. Now, I'm not usually a soil person. I don't know very much about soils. But I've gotten to know the magical soils of the Palouse country as it relates to the Ice Age floods. And so that's really our discussion tonight. And actually, I want to frame our next three meetings. Tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday night are going to kind of work together. It's kind of a three-part mini-series. The Thornbirds in three parts, dating myself. So if I could find the schedule, I'll show you. Tonight we're talking about the Palouse Hills. That's really a sole focus on this material and asking a couple of key questions. How did this soil form? Is it a typical situation where you have underlying bedrock that weathers and crumbles and the soil is the result of that crumbly bedrock down below. That's the case with many soils around the world. In other words, the parent bedrock is the source of the material that's in the soil. It's just crumbly bedrock, essentially. Next question. If it's not from this bedrock, and it's not, then where did it come from? And when did it arrive here? And why is there so much of it? In places, this package of what we call lus which is the soils of the Palouse Hills, 
In places, this stuff is 250 feet thick. This is a freak show. 250 feet of soil sitting on top of this bedrock, and I already gave away one of the answers. This soil is not from this bedrock down below. So where did it come from? How did it get here? Is it still coming here? How can we figure out the timing of this? Is, is it related to the Ice Age somehow? That's what we're talking about tonight. Hope that interests you. And if you're watching specifically because your interest in viticulture and growing grapes, which is in these soils, or if you're watching because of your um, neighbor who does a bunch of dry land wheat and this whole incredible agricultural scene is because of this amazing lus. I don't know much about ag. I don't know much about growing grapes out here, but I do know about this material and how unique it is. And perhaps I have a couple of new ideas for you. But before I lose the schedule here, our goal then tonight is to talk about how we get this stuff. Our goal tomorrow night is when we start bringing the Ice Age floods, the Missoula floods, the amazing catastrophic floods of water coming through this picture, we're gonna sweep a bunch of this soil away and we're gonna dump it into an Ice Age lake nearby. And we're gonna look at this soil from the Palouse that got dumped repetitively into the floor of these Ice Age lakes. And then on Thursday night, in other words, um, from tonight to tomorrow night, I didn't want to screw up my picture, but I think I'm going to. So tonight is this mantle. Tomorrow night is actually getting rid of a bunch of this loose and sending it downstream and then having that loose get redeposited in the bottom of an Ice Age lake. And then Thursday is where we're gonna bring some Ice Age floods through. We're gonna take rid of the soil, but we're also, on Thursday night, gonna have these amazing waterfalls where the Ice Age flood water is actually picking up and hauling away a bunch of this bedrock. So it's kind of one, two, three, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I hope that gives you a little sense to not only wanna to tune in tonight, but also to tune in uh, Thursday and uh, Wednesday and Thursday night. Then Saturday and Sunday, we'll talk about climate, which is kind of a totally different topic. Okay, well, let's get into this by starting how we usually do scientifically. Let's just try to make some observations and get curious about what this scene is like. All right, well, we've already talked about a fair amount this basalt bedrock. We had a whole live stream on the flood basalts of Eastern Washington. My favorite analogy is the German chocolate cake. For those that are new, let's do it very quickly. There were, many, there were many different eruptions. Let's just pick one number, 16 million. 16 million years ago, there were a series of deep cracks that formed in Southeast Washington, Northeast Oregon, and even a few over in Panhandle of Idaho, near Moscow, Idaho, home of Rini and Tim. And coming out of these cracks is this Hawaiian-like lava that's going to flow over and bury a previously existing landscape. This is 16 million years ago. This is 16 million years ago. Uh, why do I call it the German chocolate cake? Well, if you do 300 of those eruptions, you can get a very impressive stack of lavas. And in its deepest, the German chocolate cake, the 300 layers of flood basalt, at its deepest is three miles thick. And we know that from drilling for oil and natural gas. We also talked a little bit about these little features. So I've got little dots at the top of each of these lava layers. Those are little vesicles, little teeny tiny gas bubbles. I've got some beautiful uh, vertical cracks that are forming typically from the bottom up with some, but not all of these basalt lava flows. Those are, that's columnar basalt. That was more than a week ago with a live stream. I haven't talked much about pillow basalt yet, but those are also features that are found. So in other words, 16 million years ago, we're doing this volcanic scene, and that is totally done. That volcanism, those lavas, that heat, that steam, that spatter, all that drama with the lavas is done more or less by 10 million years ago. And it even kind of ends with a whimper. Most of it's done by 16 million years ago, okay? Now, we've got to wait 
patiently for this lush to arrive. And before I go much further, let me try to convince you that this soil, this lus, has nothing to do with the basalt underneath. First of all, it's noticeably younger, like there's a huge gap in time. I'll go ahead and say it. We're going from 16 million to less than 3 million years ago for this soil, for this lus. This is Ice Age. Have you done this before? Have you... Uh, so many of you know the Palouse Hills, and we're going to go in the Cozy Fort a couple times and visit the Palouse Hills. But those that know the Palouse Hills, do you think Ice Age immediately? Because that is the story. For sure, none of that soil, none of this loose, none of those rolling hills. But I'm not even just talking about the shape of the hills. I'm talking about the more than 200 feet of this stuff. None of it was there until 3 million years ago. And then it gradually accumulated over the last 2.6 million years. So there's a huge time gap between the lavas and this soil coming in. I'm doing this a lot, and I'll show you why in just a second. But how can I convince you that this soil is not related to the basalt? Okay, well, by now most of us know what basalt looks like. It's a very black rock made out of black minerals. It's mafic magma. When it comes out of a vent or a volcano, it's very, very fluid. It's got low viscosity. We know the minerals that are in a basalt. You want another basalt? I'll do it. Here's a slightly different looking basalt. But again, you would agree, it's a black rock, right? with a bunch of black minerals. There's a few little gray things in here, but for the most part, it's millions of tiny black minerals inside of this basalt. Basalt, here, German chocolate cake. Good. You want one more map before we leave the basalt? If I've shown you this one much, it's one of my favorites. Jennifer Hackett made it for me. And it not only shows the entire area of the Pacific Northwest that has been flooded by this basalt, but we can zoom in on our areas today. I don't know, can I? We can go to Ritzville. We can go to Pasco. We can go over to Lewiston, Idaho, Grangeville, Idaho. And if you know that country, you know you're not driving around on basalt mostly, right? Picture driving by Washtuckna, or drop in for a cup of coffee at Dusty, or go to the post office at Hooper. These are towns that time forgot. And those that know those places are not thinking lava because there's all this loose sitting on top of the lava. So, what does the loose look like? It looks like this. So about an hour ago, I thought, ah, I should really get some lus. I should really just go grab some lus. So we live on a hill here in town in Ellensburg. And I know on the back side, on the, on the um, leeward side of the hill, there's a pretty healthy collection of lus. And so I just ran up there quick. And it's all loose, as all of this is. It's all loose. Think of 200 feet of something that's just sitting there. It's, not, it's, just, it's got this consistency. Gets blown around a fair amount, and we'll get to that. Okay, but if you look carefully, you can kind of see it's a light tan, and you're like, I don't know. Couldn't that be like crushed up basalt? Couldn't that be that black rock that you just crumble and crumble and clumped, and maybe you weathered a little bit, and you kind of get this, this tan color? Well, scientists have looked very carefully under a microscope, of course, for agricultural purposes and other reasons, and they've made a chemical analysis of the loos in southeastern Washington. And this loos, instead of having broken up minerals that you find in basalt, this loos is mostly made out of minerals, crushed minerals, that are much more similar to this. And we know what this is. This is granite. This is a rock that hardly has any black minerals in it. It's got some, 
but it's not, you know, mostly black minerals. So my first, my next major point is that we know that this soil of the Palouse, I haven't even defined what loose is yet if you're waiting for that, but we know that this soil is not simply basalt bedrock that has developed a soil cover. Even though 120 years ago, that's what everybody assumed in science. The few that had gotten out to this area and looked at these soils and started some of these dry land operations that were thinking geologically, they just assumed it was basalt that formed a soil on the top. We now know that it's crushed granite. The minerals in Luss are granitic. The minerals in Luss have lighter minerals in them. They have lots of feldspars and some quartzes and a little bit of black mineral content as well. So, those are question marks. And about a hundred years ago, in the 1920s, you can find it if you Google the Palouse problem, or maybe it's called the Palouse soil problem, I forget. I think the author is Kirk Bryan, B-R-Y-A-N. I just, I just Googled it myself an hour and a half ago, and I found it and just wanted to double check the date. It's 1926. And I don't know who Kirk was. I don't know what his story was, but he was a geologist, and he basically wrote this paper, you know, acknowledging Brett, who was just in the area, acknowledging a few others, Joseph Pardee and others. But Kirk Bryant, with this 1926 paper, the Palouse problem was the first in the scientific literature to say, where did this stuff come from? Because it's not uh, weathered basalt. And it took a long time to come up with an explanation. Now, um, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to our storytelling and our origins. But I want to stray to uh, kind of stay true to the scientific method here a little bit and do a little bit more observing, if you don't mind. So let's bust a myth. There's a pretty common myth. Maybe you've heard it, especially if you're in the Northwest. Have you heard this one? If you go out to Eastern Washington, can you get your bearings? I think there's some towns on there, aren't there? I guess there's not. So this is, this is from a field trip guide I did a couple years ago. I think this is a Vic Baker map that I colored with my little colored brown colored pencil. So here's it, I'm looking at this backwards now, but here's Interstate 90 at Vantage and Moses Lake and get a burger at Ritzville and then you're on your way to John Stockton's house in Spokane. Okay, and here's the Columbia River, Wenatchee, and heading down south. You kind of got where you are now. And what's all the brown? That's Luss. So the Luss is not everywhere, but there's a healthy amount of Luss. And especially down here near Washington State University, that's probably the most famous place to kind of visualize where Luss is. But there's varying amounts of Luss sitting on top of the basalt bedrock. So what's the white? The white truly is places where the basalt bedrock is exposed. And that's coming tomorrow night and Thursday night. But we're just focusing on the brown tonight and we're visualizing on average 50 feet of loose soil that's crushed granite sitting on top of the basalt bedrock. Okay, so have you heard this myth? Oh, it's so productive out there there's so much money to be made in agriculture and growing grapes because they're volcanic soils. Have you heard that? That the soils are so productive, they're so fertile because there's all this volcanic ash in them. I I found another little vial of, of ash that somebody gave me. So this is St. Helens ash from 1980. And I think certain, maybe it's just marketing, I don't know, but I think it's kind of sprung onto a lot of people's minds. I think many people just assume a bunch of this is just ash that fell out of the sky. Like, it, it makes sense in a way. It kind of makes sense in a way, doesn't it? The Cascade Volcanoes are over here, and we've talked about Cascade Volcanoes before, and we know that there's generally winds blowing from the Cascades. You can think Mount Rainier, you can think Mount St. Helens, whatever you like. Take, take your favorite Cascade Volcano, 
have it erupt, and it's for sure that ash is getting blown to the area we're talking about today. But if you make a careful survey, if you start digging trenches, let me show you a couple pictures. So this is from a handout, I think, and even a photo that uh, Carl Lilquist took. Carl and I lead these field trips together for old people. And here's Carl looking at a pretty thick collection of Lewis. I think this is actually north of Quincy. So we're, we're in central Washington. We're not, we're up in the Beasley Hills basically, but this is all Lewis mostly. I said, this is all Lewis mostly. This is mostly Lewis with a few other detailed soil horizons that I don't understand. But my point is, there's hardly any little faint layers of volcanic ash. This soil in the Palouse is not just a big dump of snow that fell out of the sky, meaning volcanic ash. And the folks who are gr growing all this magical, wonderful wheat and all these great grapes and all these, these fruit orchards, uh, they're, they're not using soils that are all volcanic in nature. So I'm building you up for some sort of answer to this question, where is all this crushed granite basically come, come, coming from? And you maybe already have your answer. But I do have a few surprises up my sleeve that I think might please even the uh, folks who uh, have, have heard most of this stuff before. Okay, we feeling okay? Am I moving too slow for you? I, I feel like certain topics, especially with kind of a broad area with a place that many of the viewers have never experienced, uh, I, I wanna lay the, 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 the context a little bit more than I can. Okay, do I wanna do anything more with origin? Oh, sure, why not? I brought this prop out. So for a visual, not only for tonight, but to help us for the next couple of nights, we have our lavas, when? 15, uh, 16 million, right, 16 million? And we're going to start bringing our Luss somehow and, and, and loading it up on top of this German chocolate cake. When are we going to start that? How many millions of years ago? We're going to start bringing this Luss in. What was the number? Right. The oldest of the Luss is going to start coming in 3 million years ago, even though this thing got done 16 million years ago, more or less, 15 million years ago. So there's a huge unconformity, a huge gap in time between the basalts and the Luss. All right, this is almost pointless, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's fun. I think it'll be fun. I don't even know if it's going to work. This episode of Nick from Home brought to you by Bob's Red Mill Flour. you got to love it. So I had this idea last night. Oh, I'll put some Luss on the basalt. And then I'm like, well, I don't have a German chocolate cake. I got that map. It's like, oh yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll just open this up. Get in trouble for using some of the flour. Although this isn't the organic stuff, that's the good stuff. So I'm not gonna be in too much trouble. But it just occurred to me holding that map up that I don't know if the, you need to be able to see what I'm doing. The ice age has begun. It's 2.6 million years ago. If you look carefully at the details in the Luss, it's clear that it got blown in. It was not brought in by water. The 50 feet of Luss, let's just use that number, that's an average. 
the 50 feet of soils in the Palouse Hills are a bunch of kitchen flour. They have the consistency of kitchen flour. This is like a, a scene from Scarface now. I forgot a credit card. This is Aeolian. This silt, this soil was brought in on the wind and was deposited. That is for sure. We know how to study soils. We know how to study particle sizes. We know how to say if something was brought in by water or by wind. All of this loess was brought in by wind. And it was brought in by wind during the ice age. So we're getting closer to try to discuss where this soil came from, where this silt came from. But it's truly silt and that's why I used Uncle Red's flower, whatever the hell it's called. All right, you know what flower is. You know what flower feels like. This is from the kitchen. It's not sand, but I can't see, even if I have a magnifying glass here, I don't know how I'd hold it. Even if I held a magnifying glass with my tongue and looked through it, I wouldn't be able to see individual grains of flour. It's microscopic. Now, even tinier than that are little particles of clay. So clay particles are smaller than silt particles. Silt particles are, are smaller than sand particles. And if you're a geologist who've learned the old ways, and I guess I've learned the old ways from old timers, if you're out in a deposit and you're trying to decide, I don't know, I can't tell, is this silt or is this clay? Because there is an important difference. Silt usually means brought in by the wind or you're in a floodplain of some sort. But this is not floodplain. This, the loess we're talking about in the Palouse Hills Silt that was brought in by the wind for sure. So the only field check that I know of, because you can't just pull out a ruler and measure the difference between silt and clay. Do you know what the, what the trick is from the old timers? This is going to be Al Pacino now. Just forgive me, okay? Here's the trick. You take the silt, and if it truly is silt, it leaves a grit on your teeth. And if it's clay, it's smooth on your teeth. Now that was easy to do. That was flour. But I am a geologist. So you know what I gotta do, don't it, don't you? If this is silt and not clay, it's gonna be gritty on my teeth. This is the loess that I collected an hour ago. It's silt. Who cares? Why would you care about something like that? Is this just showtime now? Is there any point to this? The answer is yes. Let me show you why this is important. So these are three particle sizes that are super tiny. You see this, this is a, uh... This is our uh, contraption by Steve, Cozy Fort by Steve, trademark. So we need to carefully look at the particle sizes in this loess. I've already told you it's silt, and now I can actually say it. Loess is a word for us in geology, it has a Germanic origin. Loess is wind-blown silt. It's not sand, it's not clay, it's got to be silt. It's got to be the particle size of silt. So if you really don't have much of a social life, you Google what the particle sizes are. What is the grain size? Google, Siri, what is the grain size of fine sand? Which I actually had to do pathetically two hours ago. I felt horrible. And Siri says, the average particle size for a tiny grain of sand that we would call fine sand is two tenths of a millimeter. You know what a millimeter is? Two tenths of it, less than a quarter of a millimeter. It grains of sand. I'm leading to something. Hang with me. Silt, which is our topic tonight, silt is gritty on your teeth. 
Silt has this particle size. What is this? I'm reading it backwards. Two one thousandths of a millimeter. So the particles are smaller. You can see fine sand. You can't see the individual grains of silt. And clay is less than two one thousandths of a millimeter. Who gives a blank? Who gives a blank? Here's the payoff. These soils are so productive, not because of their chemical makeup, not because they have so much volcanic ash within them. They hardly have any volcanic ash within them. Instead, these soils are so absolutely prized and precious because of their grain size and how they can hold water. We all know that water is king in the arid west. And it's the silt sizes in the Palouse soils that make those soils so prized. Let me explain. Maybe you've already made that connection by looking at my sexy whiteboard here. This is like a game of Goldilocks. And in fact, we're gonna look at this episode of Nick on the Rocks called the Goldilocks Soils of Whatever. And I'm, I'm rolling my eyes because nobody can find the frickin' show because it's called the Goldilocks Soils. I kept saying to the producers, can we please just call it Palouse Lus or something? Not, not sexy enough, not good enough. Nobody's gonna find it. If you call it Goldilocks Soils. Anyway, I used an analogy in the show about Goldilocks and you know the story of Goldilocks probably. And so Goldilocks is trying to find, I don't even know the story, do you? Yeah. Okay, what is it? She's, she's trying out beds. One bed's too hard, one board, bed's too soft, one bed is just right. Well, the soil size, the particle size in the Palouse soils, if the Palouse soils were all sand and then water landed on those Palouse soils, the grain size would be too big, the pore spaces and the permeability between the particles would be too big and the waters would just drain right through and the soils would be too dry and Goldilocks would be sad. Or if the Palouse soils were these teeny tiny clay particles. By the way, just as an aside, do you know what kind of rock you get if you take all these super tiny clay particles and heat them up and pressurize them and make a sedimentary rock? That says shale. That's what shale is. Shale is this tiny of particles, mud we call it, right? You go, you go swimming in your favorite swimming hole, not a swimming pool, but a, like a, a lake, and you stand in the bottom of your lake, what do your toes go into? A bunch of mud, right? A bunch of clay. So if the Palouse soils were nothing but these teeny tiny clay particles, the water wouldn't be able to penetrate at all. I'm talking about rain and I'm talking about snow melt and it would just pond on the surface and the soils would be worthless then as well. And Goldilocks would be sad. But the silt sized particles of the Palouse soils are just right just right to retain water can you see my little blue dots here bluish greenish dots the water's hanging out within the soils those soils can retain can hold their moisture for weeks maybe months snow melt especially that's why you can grow these incredible wheat crops without irrigation you have heavy snow presumably you have the snow melting into the soils and because of the particle size, the soils hang on to the water for a long time. Okay, it's already 6.30. What do we have left to do? We gotta go to the cozy fort, but we also need to talk about where geologically we're now confident that these soils are coming from. Oh, we had brilliant sun for the first time, that's interesting. So, I'm gonna give you our best idea currently. And I think there's room for improvement on this, but we've done a bunch of evidence, haven't we? We've done a bunch of observations and that's important. All right, so I want to do this on the board even though there's probably a decent glare now. You 
if this loose is being blown in and blowing on to the basalts of eastern Washington, Even though I think we're still trying to debate the ultimate origin of this kitchen flower, now that you know what we're talking about, I'm just going to say kitchen flower. You know what I mean. I mean the silt-sized particles that are more than 200 feet in places in the pollutes, right? So where's the kitchen flower coming from? It's got to be related to the glaciers. It's got to be related to the glaciers. Have you been hiking in a beautiful mountainous area that still have some active alpine glaciers? Have you? What do those lakes look like? A beautiful alpine lake right below an, ap an active alpine glacier right above it. What color? It's an amazing greenish blue, isn't it? It's not a normal look. And what's the explanation for that greenish bluish emerald like look of those alpine lakes with an active alpine glacier right above the lake? Right, the answer is that glacier can grind up rock to the consistency of kitchen flour. It's called glacial flour, quote unquote. Glacial flour. The glacier grinds the rock into flour and that flour gets washed into the Alpine Lake and that kitchen flour hangs out in suspension. It doesn't fall all to the bottom all at once. And so when sunlight, like I have right now, hits that lake, and there's enough of this kitchen flower in an alpine lake, that glacial flower floating in the water, you're gonna get these greens and blues. Well, that is a bigger story with a bigger glacier that we know, we know we had one of those amazing glaciers to the north of us during the Ice Age. That's why it's called the Ice Age, right? We had our ice sheet, which we've talked about a number of times, Think of that ice sheet as being able to grind up rock and create this, basically it's a glacial flower factory. It's a grist mill. These glaciers are grist mills that are grinding out our kitchen flour. And I don't think it's appropriate just to focus on the ice sheet in Canada, but we can go ahead and focus on the Alpine glaciers as well that are to the west of the Palouse and then are gonna have winds blowing out of the Cascades. So instead of volcanic ash snowing down and making all that Palouse soil, I think it's appropriate for us to visualize grinding by the ice sheet to the north and grinding of these tinier alpine glaciers to the west and having the winds blow all that glacial flower onto the Palouse. And you're like, okay, I guess, but give me some particulars on that. Well, here was the, this is Brett's now, and repeated in color by Vic Baker, his uh, protege, or his, uh, the person who carried on the work after Brett's. And this is what I've taught for years. And I would basically say, once upon a time, kids, the entire state of Washington was covered with a thick blanket of lus, which is no longer on the chalkboard. And then the Ice Age floods came in and took a bunch of that loose away. And that's the story I would tell. And then somebody would say, well, where did the loose come from? And I go, oh, I guess it's related to the ice. And then they go, what? Related to the ice? I'm like, yeah, well, glaciers grind up rock and they make this silt. And then they go, well, wouldn't, wouldn't that flower then be in the ice? Like, how is it getting out of the glacier and... How's this, the kitchen flour getting to the Palouse? And then go, eh, not really sure. So I've asked about every soil scientist I can find and Pleistocene geologist I can find. And sometimes I repeat myself on each field trip and they go, God, you're asking about the frickin' silt again? Seriously? It just didn't quite make sense to me until I got a couple of answers that worked for me. Maybe it will work for you. What's the question? How did the silt get out of the ice and get blown onto the Palouse? He goes to the other whiteboard. And we do have a glacier, and noticing I'm not calling it an ice sheet, I'm not calling it an alpine glacier. It could be either one. 
Could be either one in this story, okay? And what I'm focusing on now with our, with our ice sheet or our alpine glacier are these black dots. And the black dots on this little sketch is a little grain of kitchen flour. You willing to play along with me? So it's not sand, it's not cobbles. I know there's other things going on, but I'm just focusing on the, the silt now. And to be totally honest, I still don't totally understand the process of how a glacier grinds that rock up. Like where in the ice are we doing the grinding? But even though I don't have that figured out, and maybe nobody does, if you look at loose deposits worldwide, again, he points to a chalkboard that's empty. If you look for white, if you look for loose deposits worldwide, they are often nearby to a glaciated area. And there are exceptions to that that don't make me very happy. But in places that I'm aware of, a certain latitude between about 55 north latitude and about 20 north degrees latitude at least, there are these loose belts and they're often downwind of a glaciated area. So if you're willing to play along with me there, here's what I view, and I think it's relatively accurate based on all these conversations, for how we're getting the kitchen flour out of the glacier if you're willing to buy that the kitchen flour is from the glacier. Bring the rocks, big and small, including the kitchen flour, to the edge of the ice. Drop all those rocks, including the kitchen flour, into the glacial moraine, poorly sorted stuff. Then we have meltwater, as we've discussed before in prior live streams, coming off the front of the melting glacier or even in front of an advancing glacier, but it's a sloppy glacial front and we're gonna have these plains, what we call outwash plains, that are wet. There's a lot of moisture. There's a lot of meandering streams. There's probably some lakes out there where we have some topography out in the way. And yes, there's sorted river cobbles, which are the star of the show for outwash plains. But I and a few others that I value who study this stuff, they're thinking there's a lot of kitchen flour that's out on the outwash plain as well. Last step, see if it works for your brain. Let's dry our outwash plane. Let's have the ice melt back. Let's get our outwash plane dried out. All those braided streams are gone. Even the lakes that are there maybe are gone. And let's have the winds kick up. And let's have centuries of winds blowing across this outwash plane. And the silt is ready to be taken downwind. The silt was in the ice. The silt was out on the outwash plains, but then the winds are picking up the silt from the outwash plains and dumping the silt through the air downwind. And if that works for you, then it might make a little bit more sense why most of our loose is out here in the green areas. Tomorrow night we're going to the black areas where we have the dramatic ice age floods. But we are convinced that before major flooding events, we did have some sort of blanket of loose. And what I just tried to describe was the grist mill here. I've never used that before, but I think it kind of works. I'm not even sure what a grist mill is, but I think it's where they make flour, right? So the grist mill is up here. The major grist mill is up here. We're creating the kitchen flour. It's getting blown off of the outwash plains out in front of these glaciers, and it gets deposited by wind. All right, and we need visuals now, and we're about to go to the Cozy Fort. By Steve, trademark. But I wanna show you a couple other still images. So now that you kind of get a sense of the importance of this loose, this is, uh, if you know the freeway drive from Spokane to Ellensburg or vice versa, uh, mile, mile marker 192, you go by Luss sitting right on top, Luss sitting right on top of basalt all the time. And look at how different the tan Luss, which is ground up granite, looks compared to the underlying basalt. And notice how sharp that boundary is. And notice how much time is missing between the Luss and the basalt. Now, for all I know, our live Q&A could be a, a spirited discussion about that's total baloney and I've got a totally different area where that list is coming from and that'd be fine. But let me, before we get to the cozy fort and before we get to your questions, 
Let me give you one more piece of data from the list itself, which surprised me and excited me simultaneously. You might think I'm an experienced pro laying out all these dramatic moments to get you real jazzed, but the truth is I, I just am trying to find shit out in the grass. I'm trying to find things out in the grass, which is still going on at the moment. So here's one more look at our Lus. Oh, do you, you want to say hi? He's going to help me look for that J. Harlan Brett's diagram with the mantle of Luce over the top, aren't you? Aren't you? All right. You help me. You help me. Can't find it, so I'm going to draw it. You know what this is. German chocolate cake, kitchen flour on top. We got all sorts of pet names for things now, don't we? Okay, so until about 10 years ago, I would teach every class saying, this is what Washington looked like all the way from the Cascades clear over to the Rocky Mountains. And think I'm, I even say that in one of these, uh, these videos I'm about to show you. In other words, this is all very old kitchen flour and this landscape of these amazing rolling hills made out of this loose predates all the Ice Age floods. That's what I used to say. And then Carlo Quist and I led a field trip. I think it was even one of those where we had a bus. We normally just have carpooling and everybody, it's a kind of a circus, you know, but got 25 cars and everybody's got their driving directions and we just show up. But this is when I think we had a bus. And we were on State Route 26 and Carl knew of an outcrop of Luss like State Route 26, the road to Pullman from Ellensburg, and a couple miles to the east, a couple miles to the west of Washtuckna, there's a few places where they widen that road and they cut into the banks, and the banks are nothing but loose. There's like 150 feet of loose. And we found this kind of sketchy place to park the bus, and the bus driver's all stressed out that we're parking on the shoulder. And here's, you know, 100 people walking along this busy state highway to go look at this Luss. But when we finally got there, Carl said, well, now let's look in your handouts and let's look at some of these ash layers that are inside of the Luss Hills. And I'm like, what, excuse me? Like I didn't know any of that. He said, oh yeah, there's, there's an ash layer that's more than a million years old that's within the kitchen flower. And I said, what ash, what volcano? How do you know that age? And Carl shared with me a paper written by King in 2016. Oh, this wasn't that long ago. Sorry, I've got my chronology screwed up. And here's a picture of that outcrop. So here's the highway. Here's a bunch of this loos. And here's a layer of volcanic ash that's 1.1 million years old from a volcano called the Kulshan Caldera, which is in Northern Washington near Mount Baker. And I don't know anything about that caldera. Was it a super volcano? Was it a particularly explosive cascade cone? I have no idea. But my point tonight is, all of this loos was not just brought in before the Ice Age floods. There is, there are packages of loose of different ages. And I'm not gonna hit this hard because we're almost done with my part of the program tonight. But we have many of these 
faint volcanic ashes that can help us keep track of time. And my main point is, it's starting to look like these different packages of LUS are obviously getting younger as we go up. In other words, these packages of LUS are separated by volcanic ash layers, and we know the ages of the volcanic ash layers thanks to last live stream. And the, the newest wrinkle, it's not that new actually, a 20-year-old idea is that, uh, I need a map, is that bad thing about bringing too much stuff out. I can never find what I need. To explain these different packages of LUS of young ages as we go up in the stack is that originally, if we go back two and a half million years old, there was probably a continuous LUS blanket. This is me talking now. There was probably a decent LUS blanket. But then these Ice Age floods started happening and took a bunch of LUS away. But it's just like we were just talking about with this. That if you take a bunch of LUS away and you spread it out and then you dry it out, that LUS is going to be picked up by the wind and sent back and redeposited from whence it came. Another big ice age flood, take a bunch of LUS, bring it down to Southern Washington, dry out the lake, which we'll talk about tomorrow, kick up the winds, send a bunch of that LUS back to the Northeast. Recycle the LUS, in other words. And that's the reason I kept asking these questions on these field trips, because I was stuck with the idea that all the LUS was older than all of the flood events. And then it became clear that some of the younger parts of the LUS package, the LUF package, were part of this recycle story. But you keep coming back, at least I do, to places where these beautiful, graceful hills look untouched, and then they're gone. Those hills are gone. So there's a combination of the two. Old LUS being interrupted by floods, and then maybe some younger flooding events that constantly recycle the LUS and blow it back up on top of the hills. And that's where you are currently with our understanding. I think to complete my portion of the program, wow, that was too long. Why not? I want to, got the cozy fort set up. We're going to watch two short video clips. One of them has never been aired. So I'm going to talk to myself now. I still have 750 people. Tom Foster and I made two minute geology episodes. And Tom was never happy with this one. And I kept saying, would you please post that Palouse show? He's like, mm, it's missing a couple of things. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. So, this is the world premiere of just the first, I think I'll just show you the first uh, 50 seconds of it tonight, and then we'll watch the rest of it tomorrow night. <laughs> I got kitchen flour all over my laptop. I wonder how that happened. First, I think I'll just show you the first oh, uh, God. Hang 50 on. seconds of it tonight. And then we'll watch the rest of it tomorrow night. I forgot my bow speaker. <laughs> I got kitchen flour all over my laptop. I wonder how that happens. Please be quiet. I think I'll just show you. All right. Oh, we picked up some people. It's like, honey, get in here. The guy's going to... He's in the cozy fort. Rating spike. All right. You hear the birds? First 50 seconds, a never before seen episode. Two minute geology, the two minute geology.
Hello, young people. Luss Hills, just south of Hooper, Washington. This is the Palouse, a series of rolling wheat fields, winter wheat. And the hills are made out of Luss silt, kitchen flour, wind-blown silt. Before the Ice Age, this is what Eastern Washington looked like. All of Eastern Washington, stretching from the Cascades clear over to the Rocky Mountains. Nothing but this, 250 feet of Luss on top of Columbia River basalt bedrock. But we've got big areas of Eastern Washington that don't have these hills anymore. What happened? That was almost worth it. I guess I need a black blanket. I still have that glare. I thought this would be darker and it would work. This episode from Nick from Home brought to you by L.L. Bean flannel shirts straight off the bed. You gotta love it. All right, this is the Goldilocks soils or whatever the heck it's called. Ridiculous. But this was filmed by Chris Smart and edited by Chris Smart. It's part of our PBS series. This is a few minutes longer than what you just saw. Uh, but it not only talks a little bit about origin, but it features Chris's photography, which I think is sorely needed for some of you who have never seen this series, uh, this show, uh, this, uh, this area before. Crack the mysteries of the earth. Discover the energy that drives a planet and builds mountains. Uncover buried treasure and see what makes mountains blow. Find out what shapes the top of the earth and explore the secret world below with me. Nick, on the rocks. The rolling hills of southeast Washington. More than 100 feet of soil make this one of the richest farming regions on the planet. But where did the soils come from? Is it true that the soils are volcanic? rich and fertile volcanic soils blown down wind from active cascade volcanoes? The answer is no. This is wind blown silt. The soil's out here in the Palouse. There's hardly any volcanic ash in this stuff. This is Luss. And the minerals in the Luss are light colored minerals. Surprisingly, the bedrock below the Luss, basalt, has dark colored minerals in it. This is unusual because usually soils are the result of parent material, the bedrock, breaking down. But out here in the Palouse, the loose is soft. The basalt rings like a bell. So where did the loose come from? The Canada ice sheet to the north and mountain glaciers of the Cascades to the west. The glacial ice ground bedrock down to kitchen flour. The silt got flushed onto plains in front of the ice. And then winds blew the loose onto the landscape downwind. Over two million years, the entire span of the Ice Age, the silt piled up to form the Palouse Hills. A All right. lasting legacy. We're going to skip the middle part because that's tomorrow's topic, but we're going to go and finish with Kevin Pogue at Whitman, Univer Whitman College. Wonderful fellow. Oh, we got to do the Goldilocks thing. God. ...is just right for oh. storing water. Coming from the fields. There's never been a crop failure out here in more than a century. Luss is the Goldilocks of soils. The texture, the grain size, is just right for storing water. Months of snow melt being stored perfectly in these soils. If the hills were made of sand, the water would drain too fast. If the hills were made of clay, the water would pond, be too wet. So the Goldilocks soils, the loose soils, the texture is just right for storing water. Kevin Pogue, a geology professor from Walla Walla, teaches among the rolling hills of Goldilocks soils. 
He's become an expert consultant for an exciting new industry in eastern Washington. Well, the reason we can grow such great grapes and make such terrific wine is we have uh, a soil that's just ideal for allowing uh, drip irrigation to be managed by the viticulturalist. You know, you don't want the, the berries to be too big or the clusters to be too fat. You want a higher skin to juice ratio so you get more flavors from the grapes. You want the sugar content of the grapes and the acid content of the grapes to be absolutely in harmony and one way to control that is through the way you manage water. Water and soil, a magic combination. Ice Age Luss setting the table for one of the richest agricultural regions in the world, Palouse Luss. Okay. Thank you for your patience. I, uh, I'm ready for your questions. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. I'm done with my program, but I have to reveal my uh, thank you. And then we'll get up. You can go ahead and type your question in if you like, but. Um, so, Rini and Tim from Moscow, Idaho, sent this to me, big surprise, and I haven't revealed it till now, and I'm backing away. Can you guess why? They were so kind. I think I met them over in Pullman at a talk I gave last fall. But they wanted to send me something that works with our live stream. It's an inside joke. We started these live streams a month ago or more, I guess. And people started asking about Craters of the Moon and I got kind of fake annoyed because everybody asked about Craters of the Moon and we definitely need to make a show about Craters of the Moon. But it hasn't happened yet. So I've been barking at people and now people have been asking almost every time about Craters of the Moon, just as a joke. So, Rainy and Tim, Thank you, I got my shirt now. All right, to you guys, it's seven o'clock, that's a record. I say that every time, but I think it really is this time. Uh, I'm happy to go along with you if you are. I'm scrolling back and trying to read the uppercase questions and I'll do my best. Uh, what the heck? Where are they? Why are we stuck with clay on the west side of the Cascades? Bead, uh, it's more of an Ice Age lake story. So um, the grist mill glaciers are getting their loose blown to the east and to the south and landing in the Palouse and you don't have the big winds over there in Western Washington, and you have these Ice Age lakes which were long lived because there was nowhere for that water to go until the Puget Lobe melted back. Patrick, age six, does this mean it's hard to use the law of superposition because the old loose gets recycled and put back on top layers. Patrick, that's a wonderful question. If I had students who were 31 and asked that question, I would be impressed. And you are 31 minus six. You are younger than them. Um, yes, it does, Patrick. But we have to be... Yes, it does, Patrick. So if we have an area where we just constantly bring in sediment and the next layer on top is younger, the next layer on top is younger, then it's a nice, well-behaved story. But this is a complication and you have nailed it. And the next question is from Evelyn, age seven. 
If the loess came from granite and granite is igneous, then wouldn't it still be volcanic soil? I see what you're saying, Evelyn. Um, but Eve uh, volcanic soil in most people's minds, I think in my mind, I can't find anything tonight. Here. I think, Evelyn, volcanic soil in most people's mind is truly a soil that's just a bunch of volcanic ash that got uh, blown downwind from an erupting volcano. And you're right that, that this um, loess is crushed up granite, and that's kind of related to a volcano, but we know that granite is the magma chamber underneath, right? That cools and then gets crushed by a glacier and then gets sent down. So that's kind of not really a volcano story. I gotta, I gotta wet my whistle now. All that talk about wine, we gotta, we gotta check that out. William, is there evidence of erosion in, of the CRB that is still covered by the loess and how much? Is there evidence of erosion of the basalts that is still covered by the loess? If I've got your question correct, William, I know of no place where there's a basalt on top of some loess, number one. So the basalt is always below the loess. Do I know places where the loess has been eroded by a fair amount and is getting close to the basalt, but not quite? Sure. But I think your wording is, is asking if there's basalt on top of some loess because there's been so much erosion and that's not the case. And if I didn't get the gist of your question, I'm sorry. Robert, did the loess, ooh. That wine is good. Did the Luce make it to the Willamette Valley of Oregon with the, with the Ice Age floods? Absolutely. So tomorrow night we'll talk about a bunch of Luce removed by the Ice Age floods and deposited in Lake Lewis, which is in Southern Washington. But there's plenty of Luce that made it past Lake Lewis, made it down the Columbia Gorge and went down to the Willamette Valley. And so there's that Luce again. I mean, it's water lane now. That's a distinction we'll make tomorrow night, but it's still the kitchen flower. So was it like a crazy dust bowl for 300 years? Or is it most like a, a slow distribution like desert sand dunes? Thank you for the question. Um, tough, to, tough to pin that down. We don't have the dating we don't have that many ash layers to keep track of time, so we can't quite get to that level of precision of, of trying to visualize, th approve things within a, a hundred years or two hundred years. I've been frustrated by going to some of these guys who do all the research. I mean, there's some basically dirt scientists. They study soils. They study the dirt, and they, they do this kind of chronology story. It's very interesting. Um, and, and I've wanted to kind of say, well, isn't there kind of a sand dune kind of a pattern to these hills? Like, what controls the, the crests of the hills? And they say it's, it's random. There's, there's no, they aren't sand dunes. Don't call, they actually get kind of tiss, pissy. Don't call them sand dunes. They're not these, my, there's no evidence of these crests of these Palouse hills migrating like a sand dune. That's kind of what you, that's what I've asked before. Uh, but they've got enough detail there to suggest these are not like dunes in the sense that they don't march. You know that sand dunes kind of slowly change their position because you, you erode on the backside and you drop sand, new sand down the front. So, not a great answer. Could have been a crazy dust bowl for 300 years. I guess it's possible. I don't know now, even though I'm wearing a stupid t a nice t-shirt. Um... I mean, we have had some crazy dust storms from China, right? Like, is it possible a bunch of our loess is from another continent? I know so little that I ask a question like that. Doesn't seem likely, but you, you do have big piles of loess in places on the globe that are not related to a glacial 
system. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a good explanation. Feels like one of those areas that need more work from my point of view, but I'm no expert. Uh, what is the cause or causes of the hard pan and clay soil in Yakima? Thank you, Susan. Uh, hard pan, sometimes called caliche, you may have another name for it, is very, first of all, it's a, it's a layer that is very difficult to get through. Like there's a caliche layer uh, about six feet down in our neighborhood, and I've talked to guys who wanted to put in a full basement, and they literally rented a jackhammer to get through that caliche layer. That's how hard that stuff is. Geologically, I've been frustrated by that as well. Sounds like I'm frustrated, but it, it, it's the wrong word. I, I've been intrigued and never have gotten a satisfying answer. Caliche layers or hard pan, I have been told over and over and over again, is an old, is an ancient soil horizon. Like hundreds of thousands of years old, maybe millions of years, and you get some chemistry and some leaching and some carbonate and, okay, I guess. But it seems like we should be able to use those caliche layers. Are they uniform across the entire Pacific Northwest? Do they represent a former surface? So I'm intrigued by those caliche layers, especially because below some caliche layers in certain areas in the Scablands, you can find evidence of ice age floods that are a million years old, or at least, at least 680,000 years ago. And that's a topic for another day. And I don't know about your uh, clay soil in Yakima, but it's, yeah, I don't know about that clay soil in Yakima. Did the Luce Hills in Western Iowa come from glaciers in Washington or Canada? I would tie that to the ice sheet, Patty. Yes, I'm from Wisconsin. And when I took a glacial geology class at the ripe old age of 22 or whatever, uh, the instructor was deep into the Luce thing, no pun intended. And so we went to the list this and the list that, and it was all tied to the ice sheet that was right there next door to the ice sheet. And uh, I've just stuck with that connection in my mind to this, to this evening. And uh, Bruce Bjornstad, who has, uh, I can continue to plug his books because they're wonderful. We'll probably go in the cozy fort if I can get the right blanket at some point. I don't have a black blanket. I'll have to... I don't know, I'll use a bedspread or something. But Bruce has written the best books, in my opinion, on the Ice Age floods. And there's very little coverage of the Luss Hills because the Luss Hills are not really the star of the show. The star of the show is all this water coming and removing the Luss Hills, which again, we'll be talking about in the next two nights. But Bruce is putting a new book together involving all of his wonderful drone photography. And he asked me to uh, look at it and review it. And I went on my list, Jag, and he's like, I'm not putting that in. I don't think there's a tie between that list and these ice sheets. I'm not convinced that what you're teaching is, is, is accurate. And I admit that not everybody can see that tie. But to me, it's an ice sheet story and the grinding story that I shared with you tonight. You know, I, I'm careful when I, when I feel like I'm kind of spinning things the way that it makes sense for me and it's kind of a, a departure from what's in the literature, I try to let you know that I'm, I'm doing that as opposed to just kind of stating it as fact. You're still with us, how many? Yeah, we still have almost 700, good. Where are the granites in BC to make the Luss? Well, I'm oversimplifying, Jeff. Um, much of the North Cascades in Washington, and then of course over there to British Columbia, have a lot of crystalline rocks, a lot of light colored rocks. So granite, when I say granite, I mean granite, I mean diorite, I mean granodiorite, I mean magmatite, I mean gneiss, I mean schist, I mean all these, all these rocks that are not basalt essentially. So picture all those crazy varieties of crystalline rocks, grind them up real good, blow them down wind, and I think that's what you're looking at with the Palouse. A 
A lot of uppercase, ha ha, LOL, something must have happened. Oh, the t-shirt, <laughs> probably. Now somebody with an attitude, would you answer my question if I was muffler boy? I'm trying, man, don't take it personally. Is there loose in the Midwest south of the glaciers? Yes, Wade, major belt. If you just type in like I did a couple hours ago, what did I type in? Loos of North America. And you can just find a map to see the loos that was our topic tonight here in the Pacific Northwest. Massive amounts of loos in the Midwest. Again, to me, just south of the ice sheet, blown down wind. But then there's a bunch of loos down in like the deep south. I don't get it. Um, maybe outwash coming down the Mississippi, but again, I, I should stop now because I, I don't really know what I'm talking about. What vegetation was on the hills pre-European settlement? Boy, Rob, I don't know. So if you're a Native American walking around in the Palouse before all the ag showed up, what are you looking at? Grasses, I, 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 I really don't know. Tall grass is what I imagine, but I, 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 again, I, I'm out of my element here. Very interesting question. I ask myself that a lot. Even this beautiful valley, uh, you know, is it sage? Was it grass? Uh, you barely have, you know, photos from 1865. And then before that, you've got a few paintings. And then before that, it's, it's, it's only talking to key people uh, like Randy Lewis to, to help you learn from Native American culture. So what about Craters of the Moon? Is there less there? No. Does the loose contain some sand, like sand dunes in the desert? Sober. There's some fine sand in places, but I promise, I mean, if, if you want it, look, doesn't it sound good to just go out and just drive? Like just drive for a few hours, like this time of night. And there's nobody else out there. It's just you in the road. I don't know if it's a motorbike or just a Corvette or whatever. But you're just driving. And to me, the Palouse is one of those places where it's, it's so unique. And the Goldilocks episode just gave you a test. A little, oh, I'll show you some stuff from the air tomorrow. Uh, what got me going on that? Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time out there and we would stop and we would make a little exposure. We'd look at, you know, let's say 75 feet of loose and it is just remarkably homogeneous. I know there's a few of those ash layers, but that's why it surprised me so much because I, you can even dig through it and not really see the ash and the light is just has to be right. So it's, it's unique in the sense that it, it almost looks fake. It's so thick and it's so perfect in its consistency. The kitchen flower I'm talking about. Why does the Alpine Lake, why does the Alpine glacial sediment cause the blue green color of glacial lakes? Are all glacial lakes that color? I tried my best to explain what I know. It's a physics thing, I believe, that if you have a certain, if you have a bunch of kitchen flour and a standing body of water and then you have light coming through, especially at certain times of the day, you get that light refraction or re re reflection or refraction or whatever it is. I don't know anything more than that. And certainly not all lakes have that. But I don't think you've ever seen one of those bluish, those, those aquamarine or whatever colors you're talking about without an active glacier grinding away upstairs. I don't, I don't see how you can do that color without an active glacier, but I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm wrong. How old is Luss? Does it depend on where the Luss is located? Thank you, Daniel. The Luss, the oldest ash layer I know in our Luss is 1.1 million years old. And there's tens of feet of Luss below that. And we can use superposition there. So it's at least 1.2 million years old and probably going all the way back to the beginning of the Ice Age, which is 2.6 million years ago. Um, 
But the, 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 top, the, the upper parts of those Luss hills appear to be this young Luss that keeps getting recycled. Thank you, Daniel, for the question. I guess I'm down to pretty fresh stuff here somehow. If sand becomes sandstone and clay becomes shale, what does Luss become? I guess siltstone, I don't know of a place where Luss, since Luss is so young, since Luss is Pleistocene's Ice Age stuff, uh, I don't think we've seen a siltstone that was formerly Luss. Most of our, that's what they asked, the answer is siltstone. Most of our siltstones are the result of rivers bringing a bunch of silt, like the Mississippi Delta, and then you bury enough of that silt below surface until it becomes siltstone. I'll scroll back and catch a few more, and then I think we're done. It's almost 7.20. Wow. That Robin's going nuts over there. What are the dimensions of volcanic ash compared to silt or clay? Oh, you mean the particle size thing? I don't know. It's, I don't know. And it, 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 prob it definitely varies depending on how far you are from the volcano. Do you remember the Afreda guy? Was it Jim? Had coarser volcanic ash than we did here. I mean, this is our ash. This is the ash that fell in Ellensburg. It looks, whoa. Oh, never done this before. This is how we'll finish. Mount St. Helens ash on my teeth. It's gritty, but maybe that's because of its origin, not because of its sediment size. It's like grinding pumice on your teeth. Here's to you. I got no food out here. Oh, I do. I got food out here. Here's to your health and the health of your parents and grandparents and the health of your children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and cousins and uncles and aunts. Here's to the health of all of us around the world from different cultures, different backgrounds. And here's to another week of what we've been doing for quite a while. Here's to you. Another quick look at the schedule and we're done. Please join us tomorrow night for essentially part two of this three-part lecture where we follow the Luss in the water and look at the Luss getting deposited in the bottom of Ice Age lakes and learning more and new information about the timing of when these Ice Age floods took place here in the Pacific Northwest. And then things will get quite dramatic with video clips galore and some discussions about Ice Age waterfalls, both at Palouse Falls and Dry Falls primarily here in the Pacific Northwest. Thanks for joining us tonight so much. I love you all and I love you. Good night from Ellensburg, Washington.